All right. So before I hand it over to our speaker, um, I'd like to point out that we have a QR code on this slide. So if you wanna take out your phone, you can actually scan that and it's going to take you to a few links that Zach curated, um, some articles, some resources, tips. Um, so I'll leave this up for a moment so you can, you can check that out. Um, and then after that, we ask that you please put your phones to the side um, and uh, enjoy, enjoy the talk. So let me, and a hot tip for those too, if, if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, for our talk, there's a way in your upper right corner to select speaker view versus gallery view, and then you'll be able just to view Zach um, during the talk. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I'd like to pass it over to Zach. Hello, my name is Zachary Burke. I live in Marin County, California. In November, 2022, NAMI Marin offered me the opportunity to join the Stories of Marin storytelling class. In this class series, I began the process of turning my private story into a public talk. Yes, I live on a narrow balance beam between bipolar two and autism spectrum disorder abbreviated as on the spectrum or ASD. Today, I share my seven year manic depressive decline and my escape from that decline. My decline was gradual, unnoticeably small changes that accelerated over a span of years. Simply put, I fell off that narrow balance beam. Hopefully the time you spend listening here today will shift your practices. And for some of you trained people, your CEUs, to involve and support people experiencing ASD along with bipolar or depression. My backstory is I was diagnosed in first grade with pervasive developmental disorder, abbreviated PDD, <clears throat> later to be lumped in under the autism label in the DSM-5. But my clinicians back then only dealt with depression. My youth was above average, normal to some. I was raised by nice university graduate school achieving parents. My mom stayed home to assist me and my brother. We lived in a house in a nice part of town. And when I was five years old in 1984, clinicians lack of education and awareness regarding ASD hindered my providers from giving me the help that I needed. I went to many nice schools, all in one county, some of which placed me in stunted resource programs for special needs. Since then, our access, your access to information and resources has evolved. What is common knowledge has changed since then. In 2004, I arrived in Marin County for treatment for bipolar II, which often manifests as depression. Depression and co-occurring ASD come and go inside me in a variety of intensities, and the effect that's this affects my outside world too on the spectrum sometimes means off other things I would like to accomplish. Often I am painfully silent around other people and they notice, including people I would love to befriend and further in fact, who I might never see again because we are outside our local spheres as we are at a music festival in another town or at a traveling talk. For now, my more mellow managed burden includes occasional debilitating depression, Sometimes I can't rally myself to get out of bed, even if I want to. For a few days in a row, I succumb to sweaty, unwashed hair because I have no energy to wash it. I remember when it was worse, just a couple of years ago. As much as I loved spending a whole year lying prone under the covers, I had no choice. I had to wake up. Okay, you say, so you're one person having troubles one person i know a lot of one persons in my life consider this i am not the only one some people now experience similar challenges to mine and will need to enter your workforce next year or next month that is if they can why because money doesn't grow on trees and hunger is real in addition our numbers are growing Consider now, wherever science looks across the globe, the frequency of diagnosis as on the spectrum for youth and adults is rising. 
As someone on the spectrum, I experienced unplanned pitfalls, still do. Others will be susceptible to the same pitfalls. With these new social supports, those who used to be silent and sidelined and very kind souls without the skills to venture out may venture out of their own enclosed minds and we all will witness amazing creations from these people. Maybe they will even give a talk to an audience. Public service announcement. Please teach assertiveness skills to your clients. You may have to look in books, Google, the eyes of your colleagues, and insights gleaned from your personal enrichment. From both sides of the desk, when clients and providers can express assertively their related thoughts, wants, and needs, especially to maximize clinical effectiveness, then both parties involved are more effective. Assertiveness is your shared language. It is the Google Translate of mental health access and social work and for bridging generations and families. If somebody you encounter knows why they are sick or knows how to tell you what they can upfront, they will help to fill in some of your preliminary blanks and then you can integrate their hints and treat them. Who cares? Who cares? Who is listening today? Clinicians, mental health and ASD advocates, people who are on the spectrum themselves and family members of people on the spectrum and maybe some people who pride their own way out of depression or are in the grip of it now. I would like to gather the people who can do something, lift a finger, and as you do, give your money to the breadlines and also teach and practice assertiveness. Watch the effects on those above and those below. Teach the words for help. Breadlines are honorable pursuits. But what if you could help bread lines dwindle by training people to ask how to ask, by helping people to get their needs met the first time? Learn, engage, teach out loud. Back to my talk. This talk is my small voice in a thunderstorm. As one who lived in and currently lives in Marin County in other institutions, institutions, for 100% of the past 20 years, I know the ropes in Marin. My social support services and living space have been wholly provided by Homeward Bound and Buckaloo. In the last seven years, aside from formal accommodations, I have been hospitalized twice, stayed at Casa Rene three times, experienced an arrest, and I lost five years plus one more, and in the last two years of which COVID happened. Taking you back to three years ago, sliding farther off that balance beam on which I must live my life, I end up bedridden. I am paralyzed with depression. I have no energy to move forward in my life. My world is shrinking on all sides. It feels to me there is no way out. I have to make peace with so many things. I begin consciously parting with things I loved as I realize my life is gone piece by piece out of desperation. I cope the best I can. I choose to decide that I am at peace with never doing, never getting to do this or that again. I release those keys of my existence, including activities that I loved, still love, relationships, running, mountain hiking, dancing, and travel. Also, I lose the freedom to prepare my own meals. Goodbye to cooking for myself because my year in bed leaves my back muscles atrophied and my body too numb to stand too weak to hold myself up to cook a meal at the stove. I am in bed 22 hours a day. I don't really look out my window. I have been out of touch with the outside world. There is a town a mile up the road from my house. I cannot tell you what is happening there because I have not been that far from my house in over a year. Other than the donut cornucopia across the street that is 7-Eleven, I do not leave the property. My body, my body is dirty inside and out. Do you remember how you looked sideways at a man who had not washed his hair in three days? Me, now, I have my own matted hair, which has not seen soap or water in a month. Yeah, four weeks. And did I mention 7-Eleven is the only place I shop? 
my diet is energy drinks and donuts. It turns out I can run a body on donuts and energy drinks as long as I don't move it, right? That's not normal. For some, bathing is the daily ritual. In my case, in my weakened state, since the water hurts my skin and I recoil from the sting and my visibly debilitating depression renders me unable to mark time, psychologically, it takes me a month to prepare for a shower. This much to the chagrin of my housemates. You take a bath. Well, no, I am too heavy and weak to get into the bath safely. Never mind trying to get out of the bath. Once I had a car. That was how I got around. And even now the city bus intimidates me. The noise, the people and the wide open space inside so I do not go anywhere for months. Community mental health literally threw itself against my door. From out in the hall, I heard, help is on its way. Come bridge team, social workers, IHSS registration. They thought they had made their way to me. And then my energy was so low, I was unable to respond to any mental health assistance. They stood at my door and knocked. I did not answer. I was a major part in my not receiving services, and this prolonged my collapse. In these seven years, I have given up so much. I know what it feels like to lie in my bed waiting to die. My year of living in my bed ended finally eight months before I began to collect my story in the NAMI storytelling course. And today, 12 months have passed. I am back with the living on Zoom. All this and yet time stamp COVID. Since my depression tied me to my bed, I felt COVID very little because I did not really go outside. Even so, I was still deeply altered by the experience of my mental health challenge during COVID, a long time when nobody else was going out either. Research. The CDC has a webpage. You know that, a whole website. You have been there. This, you could probably quote back to me. Here is a novel application of the current government research. In 2023, now the CDC online has information on early developmental milestones for any child that are also very relevant to understanding people with autism spectrum disorder of any age. Online are CDC checklists, those that rate normal development by age. I can identify with a sampling from milestones expected for age three. According to this milestone, an expected interaction for three-year-olds under observation talks with you in conversation using at least two back and forth exchanges. Do I even do that at age 44? Or do I just start talking? From me, you get unstoppable prose or painful silence. This milestone is keyed in for age three, although it is a milestone I still struggle with even now. When compelled into a conversation, I may talk. If we talk about something I love, one or the other of us will be doing a lot of talking because I engage deeply with my few interests and the rest of the world only makes sense to someone else. For all that normal upbringing, bluntly, I just do not see the social conventions others do. Social conventions are not on my natural radar. When I'm not talking, I'm a great observer. Another CDC milestone for age three notices other children and joins them to play. I notice and I don't play. Freely, I can watch people from across the room for hours, even if I know them. It's like a portable baseball diamond and I just watch the game. Yes, I enjoy people my age and I want to talk and play, but the skills to join my peers never stuck in my head, especially in my younger years and throughout high school. As you may know, high school is where many people meet their BFFs, best friends forever, not me. It's not that I couldn't learn the social skills, but as I said, they never were something that made much sense to me. The CDC has a page called Learn the Signs, Act Early. 
acting early would be ideal. There are others like me, some even younger, as young as preschool age, who would benefit from their provider's awareness of these CDC milestones, maybe earlier in life, to facilitate them to form supportive long-term connections. Back to my story, seven long years ago, back to when my life started to stop at the origin of the fallout at the gym. Even after the six years I already spent at the gym and in my peak physical condition, autism spectrum disorder can affect me where I felt more, most comfortable inside this gym. Shockingly, with all the former stability around me, loud hand dryers in the new locker room triggered in me a seven year manic depressive cycle. My scene at the gym was good. At this one place, I would Zumba dance, take yoga classes, stretch my body and talk to the guys. Within these walls, I came alive. Most days of the week, I spent from eight in the morning to two in the afternoon there, lifting weights and catching multiple aerobics classes each day. The gym was a whole lively ecosystem <clears throat> I relied on. The workouts got me into my body and the talking to the guys got me out of my social isolation and into community. As my respite, after all the time in the big open space of the gym, I needed to check in. I sought a transition from the loud music of the aerobics classes and the grunts and clanks of the weight room, tranquility, the quiet locker room at the end of the hall, a welcome shelter was the only place the guys slowed down enough for us to talk. The only place in my day I had found to talk with other conscious, sentient men. Management changed something drastically. Management told us rent for the gym space had soared to $40,000 a month. They told other members and me that this forced them to close this gym and look for a suitable location to reopen. The gym moved from the spacious storefront on the town's main street to an abandoned lumber warehouse a mile down the road. If the trip hazards in the new aerobics rooms and a jack in the box drive through buzzing with life from one row over weren't enough to make me feel unsafe and unloved, jet engine hand dryers appeared on the equi new locker room walls. The whole space erupted repeatedly from end to end with the deafening mechanical roar stopping conversations in the locker room every time one of the many other gym patrons exhausted the water off his hands. My ultra sensitive hearing did not evolve with this new noise. Now my Zen relaxed place to talk and check in with the guys felt like an open cube under the flight path of a busy international airport. We all suffered the constant loud interruptions. I asked management for assistance with all that racket, or maybe a redesign, to which they replied, the hand dryers are state of the art. That's it. Stop asking us to change them. As much as I wanted to be my kind of social, I could not handle the noise. I lost faith in management, and losing this trusted ally in my eyes with this impasse, I lost the freedom to express my thoughts, wants, and needs assertively or otherwise, both to management because now they would not listen and with the guys because now they could not hear me. Sadly, this loss broke me. After one month, they too had lost me as a member. In this parting, I chose to give up so much, including half a decade of physical stability and social connection and ritual. For me, ritual is survival. When I walked away from this gym, I ceded a huge amount of my energetic stability and my lifestyle. My ritual manifests in patterns, both physical and social. Another on the spectrum characteristic insisted itself. I had patterned my life, specifically around the old gym format. Friends and family offered a cure. Why not go somewhere else? The gym seems really important to you. However, I could not think of switching gyms. Not only were all the other gyms farther away or just enough different, 
but also the notion of switching meant defining new patterns, dealing with new teachers and meeting new members. Although my fitness and social patterns would be lost when I quit this gym, however, I focused more on what being in this gym meant and less on how leaving it would force me to undesirably break my finely tuned in place rituals. My physical health, my vitality, and my mental stability began to decline as I stayed away from this gym. And my boycott of all gyms was partly in protest and mostly in memory of the discomfort from my dissolution with the management. So where where did I end up this time? For me, Marin Community Mental Health gave way to the Marin County Impact Team. When I became an Impact Team client, I was unable to go outside because I could not walk for more than a few steps or to bear loud sounds, sound hypersensitivity due to ASD. So witnessing moving buses and leaf blowers and people yelling almost crippled me. I was morbidly obese and mobility challenged, and I was also beyond morbidly depressed. Psst, I got a life-changing gift. Somehow my impact psychiatrist got approved for home visits. And for me, who was terrified to leave the property, she made it possible for me to take up mental health services again. Mania, bipolar has two sides. I got access to my mania. My depression was debilitating more recently as we witnessed. While earlier, years before my bout of depression hit, years before I met my impact team psychiatrist, I had an extended manic episode. Yes, the other side of bipolar. I was happy and courageous. I did lots of walking and collecting and even experienced chance meetings with police officers and park rangers who often told me to just move along. Sounds pretty nice, huh? Then on June 24th, 2019, I spent a night in the Marin County Jail. I went to jail because of, I believe, being in the wrong place at the wrong time and my stress aphasia. The police accosted me on 4th Street in San Rafael and said, I was a homeless person they were supposed to detain. They pulled on my arm and asked me for my personal information. Although they asked for my name, I felt it more important for me to assure them, without a doubt, I was not homeless because I began to explain myself to them. Thus, I was me, not the homeless person they were supposed to detain. Stress aphasia, which is co-occurring on the spectrum, left me at a loss for words, especially words fitted for the situation, words that would have saved me a lot of drama to come. In that instant, I was unable to say anything else on my own behalf, even if I had wanted to, detained and transported, booked, released from jail the next day. I heard nothing from the courts during the pandemic about that night I spent in special housing. All at once, after two years of nothing, hello, a summons to appear at the county courts in the Marin County Civic Center. This was to be an upcoming court date for misdemeanor resisting arrest. In quick succession came public defender, haircut, court appearances, charges reevaluated and commuted to mental health diversion. Due to solid legal and mental health worker advocating, a big thanks to the Marin County Public Defender's Office in Buckaloo and Marin County PHRS. My mental health diversion included a court to mental health care providers negotiated laundry list of to-do items. My incentive, if I did what this new agreement said, the courts would dismiss the criminal resisting arrest charge. The list included, but was not limited to, a forced trip to Casa Rene for a month and 40 hours of community service. After many back pain hours of scraping gum from under banquet tables at a community center, I got lucky. No, this, the Enterprise Resource Center, a peer run day center at the Marin Health and Wellness Campus in San Rafael offered me half days in a less body intensive regimen. I finished my hours there. 
I began to realize my time spent at the Enterprise Resource Center is much better for me than my endless days curled up in my room. Hey, look, he's out of bed. He showered and dressed. He has regular weekly mental health related activities. He's placed. So I spent a lot of time at the Enterprise Resource Center. Think bottomless cup of coffee, temperature controlled air, and big soft leathery couches. Is there more? Yes. Socializing. I show up at the ERC and I meet other peers inside. My peers are those afflicted and stabilized. I even go out to socialize with them, to eat and to concerts and even to dances. When I have somebody with me, I can go places I would not go alone. It helps. I'm sure you agree. At home, once the site of the void, I claimed a safe space for myself. At the outset, I could barely get myself off the ground or out of my bed. My relatives rendered me a recumbent exercise bike set up in my room. I started exercising again. I sat atop my new bike in motion. There I was pedaling away and surrounded by my own metrics. According to the scale and the pants that won't button and my inability to reach over a mountain of my own flesh to pull on my socks, I had a light bulb moment. A year of lying in bed, eating donuts and drinking energy drinks does not come for free. Good news for me, I lost so much weight on the bike, my belly changed shape and I could even tie my own shoes again, which was physically impossible during my depression. I spent longer and longer on the bike, often watching movies. This new discipline, which it has become, is time consuming, yes. To maintain myself from wake up to showered and fed, it takes me four hours every morning. Acceptance and persistence, I know, I live it. In between times, I take walks in the trees. See, ever so slightly, I made it back out into the world with momentum building. You hear the heartbeat. Through ICS Marin, I inched my way out even more. After their interests assessment and a job skills evaluation, Irene Klein, now retired, opened an opportunity for me to try out a volunteer job in the community. I requested just once a week, from listless and comatose to activating a calendar and prepared is a pretty major leap in functionality. On the appointed day, I showed up, groomed and on time, and I got my second day, second week, second month. Yes, the position of volunteer means no money. So in my own little way, I am being of service. As our time draws to a close, I want to leave you with some parting words. On talk therapy, if someone does not seem to be able to talk therapy their way out of a depression, maybe the medication route is an acceptable remedy. If someone who loves you sees you smile and doesn't smile back, be kind, check it out. Fact, in the United States, depression affects one in every 10 people fact, depression is also the reason someone in the United States dies of suicide every 12 minutes. On trauma, please consider all people on the autism spectrum and also those who have spent a large amount of time seriously depressed or ecstatically manic to be in trauma or have significant stored trauma. Trauma-informed or trauma-directed treatments may seriously increase your access to their clinical needs. Picture a POV of tumbling through a windshield. As the world turns freeze frame in slow motion, picture someone living for six months or four years or 40 years tumbling through inside this exploding glass. Instead of exclusion of those who are not visibly disabled or formally disabled from services, offer solutions. My own physical limitations are now invisible. I have sensory hypersensitivity to sound and to cope 
I have learned to draw myself in to enter the loud or busy space. For example, to spend two hours waiting for my clothes in the roaring, visually stimulating public laundromat, or even traversing a sidewalk on a busy downtown road can leave its mark on me. I get full of sound. I'm something like a sea anemone. I have only one vent. Only so long before my sensory indoor becomes full and I have to leave. What if people had the easy opportunity to bathe and to eat? They might make a care appointment with you and show up with baseline wellness. How much more time could you devote as medical personnel in the emergency room and general practice if people had the ease of access and bathed and ate before they presented at emergency? As then your time is not consumed by treating malnutrition and skin rashes. While I was manic, I went on extended walkabout in Marin County in steel-toed boots and cotton socks. I know I showed up at the hospital in Terra Linda one night at 3 a.m. because I had no place to wash and bandage my feet. I told the nurse the supplies I needed, along with a warm foot bath and towels, and I did the work myself. I had nowhere else to do it. If I had, I would not have taken up her time to check me in and do the paperwork, and I would not have needed Kaiser's gauze and neosporin and clean towels and fresh socks. Third shift, Kaiser Tara Linda, thank you for your kindness. Not only medical providers can reduce suffering while saving a life. Edward Gunawan, my teacher, helped to reduce the suffering that weighed on me from so many years of silence by allowing me to pause in my life for a few hours once a week for six weeks and collect my traumatizing realities into a story that I brought to you today. The jet engine hand dryer, ultimately annoying and disruptive, breaking with a social system and physical fitness regimen that supported me functions which I did not replace, horrible. Being placed in the jail for the first time, being stuck in Casa Rene for a month, being stuck to my bed for a year and waking up weak, obese, and still depressed after lying there for months, convincing myself not to die, appearing in court in my own defense, that pressed me to the limit of my reality and left a mark. To note, People who live with ASD focus their minds on the few things that interest them, or maybe only one topic makes any sense to them. Often, everything else in their surroundings is just noise. We interact best with what interests us most. I enjoy user experience design that makes it easier to get what I came for. Clinicians trained to recognize and act on useful signs and ways to approach people who are not violent, but instead disoriented by internal or external stimuli. And I am open to working with providers. Also, I favor the sea creatures that wave and twist, like the manta ray and the Spanish dancer Nudibranch. What you can see and how you can see it both matter, especially to those on the spectrum. People on the spectrum often see the same things you do in a different way, different meanings, different associations. People on the spectrum too need a chance at their own voice. They answer little questions in a big way and sometimes for a few minutes longer than you envisioned it taking. If they do not come up with an answer seconds after you asked the question, it went in. No, they are processing. I think in pictures while you posed your questions in words. My translation there and back takes time. Honor me, pause yourself, regroup, take a minute to breathe your own breath and offer them, me, some time to respond. When someone whose core life is on the spectrum applies these new assertiveness skills, he or she may communicate to you differently and you will get to meet them again for the very first time. 
Today, now, I am resetting my life from depression as a 40-something neurodivergent, yet another on-the-spectrum code word. Some people have family support locally to soften the blow. However, all my relatives reside out of state, and the only social support I get from them comes through the phone and FaceTime. I live with basic state and federal medical insurance, for which I am grateful, but it is basic. My doctors treat me as they are allowed with billable remedies. That is to say, they are allowed and supported to give me pills and services they can bill for. My access to comprehensive psychological supports is minimal. As you may know, not everything is on the formulary that, dis that governs my coverage with my state and federal care. Consequently, my doctors cannot place time in their schedule to discuss my neurodivergent quirks and how these quirks might hold me back from socializing work and advocating for myself. And most important for me, how I may overcome these quirks. So on the spectrum and the depression of bipolar two cross paths again, autism spectrum disorder is there always. Depression comes and goes, but never leaves. An article from Spectrum News Online caught my eye. The subtitle is, Autistic people are four times as likely to experience depression over the course of their lives as their neurotypical peers, yet researchers know little about why or how best to help. Four times as likely. These days, everything is normal for me. My happiness is an option for me again. I have been a Marin resident for 20 years, always housed, and I live in Fairfax, California, as I have for 12 years now. After these seven years, I hold higher standards on my daily maintenance. I exercise regularly. I enjoy nature and hiking and sunshine and friendly dogs and cats and people. I have my car. I eat out at the local restaurants. I shop at Trader Joe's and the Good Earth. I interact with my world. For winter holiday, I flew Alaska Airlines to see my parents. And I have healthy activities I do in Marin, Oakland, and San Francisco by day or by night. I always come home from Marin where I strive to be in bed by 10 p.m. and reading my latest fiction book just long enough to ease into those two yawns that signal my nervous system is relaxing with the oncoming readiness for sleep. What are our remarkable similarities, you and me? We all begin and end our days with preconceptions of woulds and coulds and shoulds. We all wish it were different in some way or another, and we all put our pants on one leg at a time. This month, we all cheer as we witness our speaker cross the finish line of his big marathon talk today. Finish line? Yep, finish line for me today. As we come back into the world of talking and charts, how will you make your tomorrow worthwhile? You know, that's my time. How will you spend yours? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. That was really, really beautifully said. I just want to, you know, honor and acknowledge your creativity and your storytelling um, and your vulnerability and your courage. Just thank you. Thank you again for sharing with us. Um, and, you know, now everybody, we're at the conclusion of, of this talk with Zach. Um, but we do have time for a question. So Zach, I have, um, I do have a question here. Let me read it for you. And then if you, if we don't get to other questions, please send them to myself or Karina and we'll do our best to follow up with you um, after the talk. So Zach, I have here, um, if there's one main thing or message that you want us to take away from this talk today, what would it be? I'm translating pictures into words right now, just like I said I would. 
Um, work on the interface between you and the affected person as much as you want to jump in and fix something if you're jamming a fork down a throat it's unlikely that that throat is going to receive that fork in the most positive and healthy way if you realize that a tongue depressor might be all you need then because you talk to them and you communicate it then you have the ability to use the right tool according to what you figured out and they figured out for the right job and then you can get to treating the internals yeah great Great, thank you so much, Zach. All right, so Karina, I think that's um, that's our time today. Was there anything else that you you wanted to share? I'm seeing here um, just some thank yous, Zach, to you for thank you for sharing your story. Great job sharing your details of how you experience the world. Very enlightening. So thank you. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you, Zach. Um, as always, just very moving, and you did such an excellent job putting this presentation together. Very inspiring. I'm very proud of you. Um, and I have no doubt that everyone on the call feels the same, and we'll be passing this recording along to other providers and hopefully can learn from this. So thank you very much, and thank you, Nami Marin. Um, we're very grateful for all your efforts and for working with Zach. Um, and thank you for all the attendees. And that's it. Thank you. Great job, Zach. Great Yay. job, Zach. Yay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank See you, you all. Time.